When I first came into office in 1989, it was not a campaign issue. However, uh, the Scottsdale Police Department still wanted the case to be reviewed. They believed they did not get a fair shot at presenting all of the evidence to an unbiased uh, county attorney. Uh, there had been a lot of disagreements with the prior county attorney. And with the advent of DNA and the, the new technologies that may help us, I said, okay, let's see what we have. Let's begin to pull together all of the evidence and, and look at this. I mean, it's a homicide. And I felt it was very important at the time to send out a strong statement. That these types of crimes are not going to be just put into a drawer, that we're going to be aggressive on them. And if you commit a murder, we want to bring those people to justice. I really had no idea what they had in mind at that time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was told that they needed someone with homicide experience, and they had no one, and they had a case that needed looked at really bad. Uh, so I said, sure, OK, never thinking that it was the crane homicide until my first day on the job. Mr. Romley decided that this was a case that was solvable, and he requested uh, the police chief of Scottsdale allow me to work with Mr. Raines on a full-time basis to reinvestigate this case from the, the ground up and see if we could make it a solvable case. I wanted, naturally, all the photographs that were taken uh, you know, the, the car and that, uh, and the scene. Um, I got those, I started to go through, uh, through them, and uh, I found in a notebook that had been put together by some previous county attorney investigator, I find the uh, photograph of the tissue. And Barry was not present at that time. So when Barry joined me then at the county attorney's office uh, on the case, uh, I handed him the stack of photos and I said, look through these and uh, tell me what you what you think. And uh, he's uh, flipping through the photographs, you know, and the blood smear, and he knew about all that. And then he came to the tissue and he knew the same thing I knew. When he saw that tissue photograph, he knew exactly what it was and exactly what it meant to the case. But, you know, we were detectives, we're not pathologists. Uh, and our word is good in some cases, but we needed, you know, an expert opinion on that. Now, mind you, I called the Department of Public Safety and said, where is this tissue? Uh, and they couldn't find it. They, it had been lost over a 12-year period there somewhere it had been lost. So I took the photograph to five well-known pathologists. Um, and without any background information at all, asked them to render some opinion as to what the substance was. Uh, immediately upon looking at it, each said that is subcutaneous uh, tissue. And one of the pathologists actually even indicated to me, and I hadn't really noticed it before, uh, that there was actually a hair coming out of the, the tissue, uh, which makes it even more germane to the scene. We went through all the physical evidence. We contacted each and every witness that was talked to in 1978. We sent some items to the Phoenix Police Crime Lab and had uh, Mr. Ray Giesel uh, do some reconstruction. And he actually came up with a viable murder weapon. At the time of the homicide, the murder weapon was unknown. Uh, I mean, there were theories that it was tire irons, uh, pipe, uh, many things came up. Nothing actually panned out. Uh, when I observed the sheets uh, from the bed firsthand, uh, from the Scottsdale uh, evidence room, I observed the tool marks on the sheets. And I noticed that it was in a V-shape, and I suspected possibly a tripod at that point. I took the sheets, I located a very similar tripod, uh, and I took that to a forensic expert by the name of Raymond Giesel, uh, who was with the Phoenix Police Department at that point in time, and asked him if he would examine these items and see if there were, he could make any sense out of it. And uh, about two days later, he called and asked me to come to his lab. I did. Uh, when I walked in, he had the sheet uh, spread out on a table, and he laid the tripod on it, and it was an absolute perfect match. Not only did the legs match and the, the knurls matched, but the, uh, the head of the tripod actually matched the wound. You know, I promised the Scottsdale Police Department I would give it a fair review, but I didn't promise them what the results would be. In the end, 
I decided that this case was not going to get any better. We had lost evidence already. Uh, it, there was a lot of problems with it. I did believe that John Carpenter had committed this crime. I believed that he had to be held accountable and let a jury decide his guilt or innocence. The complaint uh, was actually filed and a warrant was issued uh, prior to our departure for California. And the way that works is we had to do a fugitive uh, warrant in California for him uh, to hold him on our murder uh, charge. After we arrested him uh, there at the scene on the uh, fugitive charge, I approached Mr. Carpenter and uh, I advised him of his constitutional rights. We then transported him down to the sheriff's office. And uh, as soon as we got inside the uh, inside the sheriff's office, I intended to at least attempt an interview with him. And I did, and he refused. He said he wanted to talk to his attorney. And I said, no problem. Um, he then asked to use, use the telephone. Uh, I took him into a, a small office there at the LASO, uh, and uh, he picked the phone up and he called his wife. I was asleep. 7.15, the phone rang, and he said, I want you to sit down, listen to me, and I don't want you to panic. He says, they finally got me. And I said, what do you mean? He says, they got me, I'm under arrest. And I just freaked. I just started yelling, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And he said, sit down, listen to me carefully. And he told me who to call. I called Richard Dawson and I, he had Mark came down and Mark was there. I said to John, I said, you know, from what I've read, it does not look good. You know, did you do this? And he said, no, I didn't kill my best friend. So I said to, I said to him, I said, well, John, whether you did it or not, what I am interested in is the truth. I want to find out what happened. And if you didn't do it, then I will do what I can to get the word out to let people know that maybe there's another side to this story. And, you know, what the police and the prosecution are saying, maybe there's another spin. There are people seen loitering. There's a red-haired guy that was a suspect. There's the angry husband, connected, by the way, to, uh, to the mob, who's angry at Bob, who's been bothering his wife. There's a red-haired woman. There's a woman that looks like Patty, his wife. And there's son Scotty, who's at the front door one morning, who's seen. Uh, just so, it's very, very complex to lay this out. But gradually, Bob is swept along by fate till it comes to that last evening. Now, every time Bob Crane stayed in a hotel, or a motel, whatever it is, this is the Winfield Apartments, John Carpenter stayed with him. There were unusual things happening that last day of his life. John did not stay with him. He had to stay somewhere else. The date did not go well. John goes home without him. That night, and this is the part I think as a mystery that I like about the Bob Crane case, he's in the apartment, Bob double locks everything. He'd been robbed in Chicago. He makes sure nobody's coming there. He's an extraordinarily light sleeper. There are things in that apartment that should have been there that weren't. There were things that were in that apartment that shouldn't have been there at all. And among the things that should not have been in that apartment were whiskey. Bob was a teetotaler. There was beer. There's John Carpenter's swimming trunks that were supposed to go back with him to Los Angeles. Cigarettes, Bob did not smoke. Um, anyway, I thought there was a treasure trove of evidence that were there, but what was missing, some of the albums were gone, that Bob had these pictures. Now, this leads you to believe there's something in those albums that's incriminating. There are videos that are gone. There is in the projector that somebody overlooked Pictures of a woman in various stages of undress that the killer did not remember to take. Victoria Berry's behavior was very unusual. When she testified, she had indicated that she had made this appointment to see Crane the night before. And she had seen, she, had, she was on the stage and said, can I see you tomorrow around two o'clock? And he said, fine. At about two in the morning, she leaves her apartment to make a phone call, supposedly to her boyfriend, Mr. Wells. But Mr. Wells denies receiving that phone call. Well, when you get into Bob Crane's room where his body's found, on the nightstand right next to him is the phone, there's a light, and his date book is open to the next day. Now, covering that date book is, of course, specks of blood that were either received in the attack or by Karnitschke, we can't figure out at this point. But it appeared to me that what had happened is apparently Crane had received a call when he was in his bed, 
from Barry and, had written, and in response to her reminding him, had in fact noted the appointment for the next day. Now she denies making that phone call, but everything seems to be consistent with that. There's a pen there, there's his eyeglasses there, the phone's there, the date book's open, and everything is there relating to her coming the next day. The morning of the 29th, when Bob's body was found, you had uh, some neighbors that were kind of upstairs off to the left that were moving in. Um, there was a uh, moving van with three movers. I had uh, been on a news program which aired nationwide, and one of these uh, movers had seen this program and had called me at the Scottsdale Police Department to say that he was one of the movers and that he wanted to talk to me about what he had seen. What he told me was that he and his friend were loading furniture out of this moving van and they had seen a, a female, which he described as good looking, walk through the parking lot and go to where Mr. Crane's apartment was. And within a matter of seconds or minutes, she came out of the apartment screaming hysterically. He had also told me that he had seen what he thought was a man that had come out of the same apartment. Uh, they had smoked cigarettes together and the man had gotten into a car and left the area. The killer was trapped inside that apartment because out front are two guys in a truck and it's 4 a.m. in the morning. They're waiting to move, the coolest time in blistering Scottsdale. And the, you can see the marks of the killer in that apartment. He goes to the window, you see the bloody fingerprints where he's pulled back the curtain. The men see someone in there and they're waiting. He cannot leave this apartment. Finally, he gets his chance, and they see him driving off. They can't identify him, but he's in a white car. We always knew that there were movers there. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know where they went. Uh, the information he gave us at that time, the description of the person that he gave us, matched that of John Carpenter. Carolyn Bure is the last known person to have been with Bob Crane while he was alive. She was a blonde woman that he had met there. Um, she accompanied him and John Carpenter and Carol Newell uh, at the safari where they had uh, their their breakfast. Um, uh, Carolyn Bure is interesting because for many, many years um, she had said that uh, she knew that uh, Bob Crane had been murdered at uh, roughly 10 a.m. in the morning. She then left town. She felt that she was, uh, you know, in fear of her life. Now, this case of Bob Crane is very, very symbolic. What is interesting about it is he's killed with a video camera tripod. The intriguing thing is, is what he did after Bob was dead. He ties the cord to the VCR around Bob's neck like a bow. Well, it's cut with a very sharp knife, a pocket knife. I don't know if too, many, too many women carry a pocket knife. But I think that that VCR cord around his neck was a symbol of a severed relationship. Everyone said, well, John did that for some symbolic reason. Well, what's more likely? A man would tie a VCR cord after he killed someone for no reason, because he's not on the film doing anything, and they've got films of him having sex with a guy all the time, or a woman who found out she was being secretly taped. You needed to hear of all the other fingerprints that were found in Mr. Crane's apartment. The vast majority of fingerprints collected, which were usable, were not identified. You needed to know that. That's evidence. You needed to know that there were no bloody fingerprints or paw prints or footprints belonging to Mr. Carpenter at the scene. You needed to know that. You need to know how many times Mr. Crane masturbated. Did you need to see a, a film of two friends engaging in sexual activity? At the time, the state got around in their case to playing the so-called sex tape, the videotape of the menage a trois between Mr. Crane, Mr. Carpenter, and uh, a young woman from Texas, I believe it was. They appeared to be bored, if not embarrassed for the state of Arizona that the prosecution would put this tape on in an attempt to sway them emotionally. When they were playing the video, nobody really cared because that was their private life that was, that had nothing to do with the murder in our, in all of our opinions. The strengths of the state's case uh, uh, relied in the circumstantial evidence. In fact, it was entirely a circumstantial evidence case. There was no direct evidence uh, uh, 
an eyewitness, for example, that said that John Carpenter murdered Bob Crane. Uh, the weaknesses of the case uh, was the same. It was strictly circumstantial. And although there was no distinction in the law between a circumstantial case and a case where there is direct evidence, uh, juries like to see some direct evidence. Bob Crane Sr. told his son that John Carpenter was becoming a pain in the ass. He told him that John Carpenter was too much of a hanger on, becoming a nuisance to the point of being obnoxious. And he indicated that I've got to make a change here. There is a, a tendency uh, for a jury to ask a question, why? Why are we getting this now? What's new about this case that, uh, that now that we should believe that, uh, that this is a good case? And you had the same evidence 12 years ago and you didn't bring it forward. Uh, we tried to demonstrate to them that there was something new, some photographs that had been found. The state of Arizona presented their case as having a smoking gun to use the vernacular of the streets. That smoking gun was allegedly some human matter that had been deposited upon the door panel of Mr. Carpenter's rental car. The problem being for the state that no one had ever collected it, no one had ever actually seen it. None of the detectives or, or criminalists or technicians that had testified ever could say they actually saw it. There was a photograph of something. That photograph was discovered in a box of photographs 15 years later, and no one could say that they'd photographed it or seen it. The human tissue caused uh, a disturbance in all our minds only because of the fact that it was missing. Uh, that, was the mo that was the key factor, because it was Carpenter's car that this tissue was in. When lawyers are in that situation, um, under Arizona law, the, the judge can give what's called a Willits instruction to the jury at the conclusion of the case. The Willits instruction allows the jury to consider that if there was a piece of evidence that may have existed that the state failed to preserve, collect and preserve, for defense testing, jury presentation, then they are allowed to consider that as part of the weakness of the state's case against the defendant. The Willits instruction had to go to the destruction or the release uh, or the, the uh, uh, for lack of a better term, the, uh, the non-existence anymore of the piece of tissue that was on the car door panel. And, uh, and I, I can't say how that impacted the jurors or how that impacted their decision, but I can say that, with, that had we had that piece of tissue, we would have been in a lot better shape. Not one of the five doctors that the state dragged in from all over the country could give you a time of death, which means Mr. Car Mr. Crane could have been murdered before 8.36 or after 8.36 in the morning. What the state chooses for you to believe is that even with the absence of, absence of any testimony as to time of death, that it had to have been prior to Mr. Carpenter leaving. Must have been. Otherwise, Mr. Carpenter couldn't have done it, and they know that. So their argument to you without one scintilla of evidence is that in fact it was before 8.36 in the morning. There was a few things that were in evidence that Judge Martin said that we didn't have to take into account only because of the fact that there was no scientific proof of what it was. Just like the, uh, the tissue, for example. That's one, uh, one thing that he said that we didn't have to take into account only because of the fact that it wasn't proven either way. It was type B blood that was on the car door panel. Uh, if we had been able to get some enzyme testing, we may have been able to convince the jury that this indeed was Bob Crane's blood. I think if they believed that it was Bob Crane's blood and that blood had been transferred from some type of instrument, then I think they would have convicted him. During the original investigation, uh, the blood was analyzed by the Department of Public Safety. Then it was sent out to uh, another outfit in, in Minnesota so that each time that sample was analyzed, it was reduced. And by the time uh, uh, DNA was available, uh, there wasn't enough left uh, to get the job done for us. Now, if, if we were prosecuting that case today and we had that same sample, because of the advances in DNA, uh, I think we probably would. We sent out a sample to Cellmark Laboratories in California. They did find human DNA on the corridor panel in the area where the blood was. 
but they weren't able to take that next step and say that it was Bob Crane's. There was nothing inconsistent with Bob Crane's DNA, but they weren't able to take that next step because of the volume and say that it was indeed uh, Bob Crane's DNA. DNA was a big factor because if there would have been DNA on that car door of Bob Crane, I, I can guarantee that John Carpenter would have been found guilty. I mean, no questions asked about that. We, the jury, duly in panel and sworn in the, the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant not guilty of murder in the first degree. Signed, four person, Michael E. Lake. Is this your true verdict? So say you one and all? Yes. yes. Is either party want the jury poll? No, Your Honor. The people who really know John know he did not do it, and he's not capable of that. He told me, I have to sit there day after day after day. It took a lot out of him. The last few years of John Carpenter's life, he was financially ruined. He was emotionally ruined, philosophically and uh, spiritually broken. Um, he had lost his, uh, you know, his, his job at, uh, at Kenwood. Um, they kept it as long as he could. It took its toll on him at the end, and I think he, he didn't, he tried his best not to let on to people that were close to him how much it did affect him, you know, that the, just the stresses and the, the things that, uh, you know, had gone on. John Carpenter had longevity in his family. Um, you know, all of his, his aunts and uncles and that, they lived to, you know, if not into their hundreds, close to their, in their 90s. And, you know, here he was at, uh, you know, 72 years of age, died of a heart attack.